Good morning and happy Monday, everybody. This is Anne. Welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host, and disembodied dance, Quindy and Justin. And Hyper Bunny, who is subscribing with Prime with, with their disembodied hands. Thank you. 23 months. One more and I have to sing. How are you guys today? I'm a little sluggish. I'm like, <sighs> my brain is, it's one of those days where you physically feel like you're a little tired, but your brain is moving at a zillion miles an hour and wants to go bunny, squirrel, bunny, squirrel, bunny, squirrel, all over the place. It's one of those days. Guten Morgen. Yes, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Is Reaper putting out the BCA paints this month? Oh, staycation. Hang in there, Iffy. Hang in there. Awesome. You guys are, as always, awesome. Look, we have an ogre. How cool for us. Two versions. Interesting. What's the other version? Mmm, yummy. I wish, Kernico. I want some sushi. I've wanted sushi for a few weeks, but I'm like, budget, 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 because the holidays are coming, right? More salmon -y color. Interesting. Yeah, I would, uh, I was thinking about putting in an order. I need some, I need some more options, some more options for minis to paint for you guys. Oh, okay. So it's probably just a different, okay. It's a different red pigment then. I know what it is then. It's actually probably what we, uh, it's an old canceled color from eons ago called bubblegum pink is my guess, but I'd have to see it. Have to see it to know it. That's my guess though. are they both like BCA pink? Like, are they both using the same, like, it's just a promo paint, but it's different types? That's because of the two different red, pig red pigments bowl. Um, the breast cancer awareness pink uses a, a cold red pigment, a blue shifted red pigment. And the other red pigment that we use at Reaper is a, is an orange shifted red pigment. So that's probably, and using those two gives you a whole range of different reds that you see in the Reaper line. So one of them is, it's probably just using the two different pigments in very similar ways. Um, same label, interesting. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what I get then if I order. All right, let's see here. That's right, we are mixing our ogre skin with our human -y skin tones, tan skin in this case, to get something that was... Uh, a little bit less yellow. Still yellow. Still pretty darn yellow. Your Rex. Rex, I saved that um, stream from my Twitch with your slime kitty over to my YouTube. So it's there. I'll probably be working on Werewolf instead this week, though. I think I covered all of the uh, things about working with transparent plastics on slime kitty. So anyway. Back to the ogre. So we were doing uh, a four, a four to two. So a two to or a two to one. Uh oh, I lost a brush tubule. One second. I always try to keep my brush tubules in like the same place so that when I need them, inevitably for traveling, I can find them easily. Hey there, Bob and Julie with the winged kitty cat today, huh? Yeah, I just wanted to let you know, Rex, no, no pressure or anything. It's up to you. At this point, it's up to you what you do with it. I'm just letting you know that you asked me to do it and I did it. Now I must move on to prepping for NaNoWriMo. So, because National Novel Writing Month, it is a coming. It is two weeks, not even. I think it is exactly two weeks. Uh-oh. Let me see. I... Ooh, I'll have to wait. Sorry. David was messaging me. I'm like, whoa, is this an emergency? Because usually it doesn't, read it. it doesn't do it during uh, streams. But he was just idly doing it. So I will ignore my man briefly. 
with for the duration of the stream. I want to talk to you guys about other possible shadows for this too. Yes, but I am totally squirrel brain today, so uh, off topicness. It it's the opposite of the Anne you got on Friday, where I actually taught a coherent class about you know color. So if you missed Friday's stream on the, our first stream on the Null Pirate, you should go watch it on the VOD because it is actually a cohesive and coherent, almost entirely on topic, essentially what amounts to a class on choosing colors and how colors change when you put other things next to them and mix color and, and the order in which you apply them can change them as well. So it's essentially a, a weirdnesses of color class. I would have a hard time really describing such a class if I was going to make it. I'm not sure what title I would put on it, but it's definitely an important class and it definitely would help people to look at it. So, Oh, I see. They said that all the new, all the new orders will get the new color, huh? Interesting. Ah, my paint clogging. Sads, it's a Monday. Yeah, my my tan skin is like nope, 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 nope. It's definitely having a moment. Sometimes you have to just keep at it. There we go. Yeah, thank you, Quindy, for the VOD. So yeah, you want to if you missed Friday's stream, you want to watch it. It is possibly Anne at her instructing best. I just I was just an Anne on a mission. Plus, I really like the Null Pirate. So yeah, definitely go and uh, watch that if you missed it. I think it is of high value, especially if you have trouble like with colors and choosing colors and developing colors and with your base coat like changing and then suddenly the color looks different after you put shading on and stuff like that. So yes, all of that, all of that happened on Friday. You should go watch it. Just, just my opinion, you know, you could ignore me. All right, so before we used a base coat and I keep these little cards um, because they're very, very useful because when, I, when you work on as many miniatures as I do, you do not remember what you are using necessarily even though it's only been six days. Um, so six business days anyway. Uh, so even though it's been a week, I always have this for reference or I would forget. So I do a what I did and then I do a swatch of it just so I can see it. Um, and then I write down once I've got, you know, a shading color, if it's at all unusual, I do that too and swatch it out as well. If the highlight color is weird, then I make a note of that as well. Though usually I am adding white, but if I add an off white or something unusual, like a skin tone, a different skin tone, then I would make a note of that. Um, I'm not into that right now, Pendrake. Not even talking about the club. I don't really want to make it a bright color. So uh, I'm thinking, but right now I have no uh, concept for it. I could go with a purple brown. Like nut brown shaded with more purple. That would be fun. But I'm not going to make a decision about it right now. Going to work on skin. Got to get the rest of this skin figured out and shade it up. And then we can work on adding some fleshy reddish tones to it. But I wanted to get that. I wanted to start blocking in dramatic shading last time. So we didn't get all of this skin base coated. We're going to do that quick this time. Huh. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, BCA is uh, is a paint that really uh, shouldn't have poor coverage because the base that it's in. I mean, maybe you got a really old bottle. Crows. If it was third party, I mean, over time, sometimes paints will 
kind of degenerate and fall apart if they, especially if they get a little bit out of solution. So uh, I don't know, but it BCA pink uh, is built in a base with a lot of white in it, and it has really no excuse not to have coverage. Yeah, it's got to be old. That's my thought. It really, because chemically it should not have bad coverage. So you'll notice that, again, I mentioned this before, when you want a smooth base coat, thin your paint. This is about, it's about six drops of paint with two drops of water in it, which means it's about a three to one mixture, which is actually a little bit thinner than I tend to work. But going over white primer, um, I find that it's perfectly adequate for a higher coverage paint. And since we are using two colors with good coverage, relatively good coverage, ogre skin has a lot of ochre in it, which helps coverage. Tan skin also has decent coverage for a skin tone um, because of its white content and also its oxides. So all things considered, three, three to one is probably the lowest though, the, the most water I would put in. Um, usually I do more of a four to one and that's a pretty, pretty solid first base coat plus touch-ups. If it's a really transparent color, then with a four to one, you may need two thin coats, but two thin coats are kind of industry standard recommended these days. So, you know, you shouldn't be surprised if you want to do that. All right, so you can either go around or you can go top to bottom depending on um, what you're aiming. If it's a small surface like this, and I'm using a relatively large brush, so I'm certain I can move pretty fast on it, I'll go top to bottom to establish a perimeter, and then I'll move around while I still have a wet edge to establish a smooth base coat. You always wanna be working against this wet edge. You don't wanna let that glob of paint dry there, or you may get an artifact to some sort of globby look or uh, unevenness to the surface. So you wanna keep working around don't stop and touch up if you see like the paint kind of getting thin on one part. Just leave it, leave it dry, go back and touch it up later because if you go back now, your edge is drying while you're doing that and that part maybe may have started to dry so you're gonna create globs and patches. So just go around, do one go around, no matter how thin it is, just finish it and let it dry. And if it's really, really too thin and you really feel, oop, I got a glob, there we go. I'm gonna wipe it off. If it's really, really too thin and you really feel like you need um, you know, a more heavy coat, that's when you add a little bit more paint to your mix to thicken up your paint for your second coat. But yeah, it just sounds weird to me. If it's not an old bottle, I'd wonder if it had froze, crows, because freezing will definitely make the paint kind of break up and not have good coverage. Hey, Shadow Spawn, thank you. 25 months for the prime, dang. Very cool. You guys who have helped us and supported us for over two, two years are really, really special. Just saying. You are special to us. I won't use the word precious because, you know, that, that would be bad and then we'd have to cast you into the fire. But uh, we wouldn't want to do that because you're special. So just saying. Like I said, squirrel brain. Squirrel brain. Squirrel brain. That's where Anne is today. Oh, I got a hair in my paint. No, as long as it's not a squirrel hair. So when you thin your paint, if you put it on really, really like just a tiny bit, your paint's going to dry super fast. And so you'll see that I'm kind of loading it on. I'm actually, my brush does not come to a good point. I've got a nice blob of paint on it. And that's intentional because thin paint will dry very fast. If you just try to put it on in a super thin coat, add extra. There's no harm to it. You've thinned it, so it's not gonna like crackle or do anything weird because you're putting it on thick. The water's just gonna evaporate and lay it down pretty smooth. So just a note on that. When you thin your paint, if you put it on just a little bit, I see people, they like have just this tiny bit of paint on the brush and they're base coating. You should not do that. Um, it will make it much harder for you to get a nice, smooth, even, good looking base coat. So make a note and uh, make sure you use more paint on your brush when you're doing a base coat. See, I came around to the side here. And the reason I started on the inside of the leg is that I knew that this edge is probably gonna be the one that dries while I'm working around the rest of the leg. But that part is hidden by the loincloth here. 
So because it's on the inside of the leg and hidden by the loincloth, even if I had some unevenness or a little bit of a glob there or an edge from the paint drying before I could get back around to it, it will be hidden because it is not an important part of the model and the loincloth hides it. So when you do this, try to start at the inside of a, sur of a surface like an arm or a leg because that's nobody's going to look there even if you so if you do get some unevenness you're going to be fine um otherwise like with him you could start at the waist and move up and around too this is a big surface though so i believe with him i mostly just started at one arm and went really fast across the front and then turned around and did the same on the back because again nobody really looks at the model from this angle or this angle oh i missed a spot Woohoo. um or, you know, that angle. So try to uh, have your, your lines start or end at a place that is tucked into a detail or at an area of the model that's really not going to get a lot of viewing. I'm not, wasn't worried about forgetting that little spot up there, for example, because it's under the club. There's a reason that I didn't even see it to paint it. So nobody, if there is a little tiny bit of unevenness up there, nobody's really going to notice it. Plus, I still have shadows and highlights to help disguise it if so. But because I'm using thinned paint, it's unlikely that I'll get a big glob. It's when you use your paint straight out of the tube um, or the bottle that you run the risk with thickened paint of having that discernible edge of wrecking that smooth texture. Smooth lack of texture, rather. Hello, Agent Marvel. Yeah, it is a hard, it's a harder lesson. A lot of people just want to touch it up right away because they see it. You, you just leave it to dry. Leave it to dry. You'll get a much, much smoother base coat if you just do, even if your paint is too thin or whatever, just keep going, let it dry, and then go back over it. Your second coat, if you have any thin spots, is going to just address that. I mean, I've got a thin spot here on the knee. It's almost reading like a really, really heavy wash. I'm almost getting that. And that's because I went three to one, um, which shows you, by the way, how you'd build a contrast paint if you really wanted to. You'd build probably a three to one with a Reaper color, yeah, with any of the MSP colors, and then maybe add a couple drops of brush on sealer. That's what I would say. Uh, and you'd end up with a very thick wash that acted very reminiscent of contrast paint. And speaking of that, I'm just shaking this up because I might want to use a little bit of it later, but we'll see. So when you have your brush on sealer, by the way, shake it until that little bead, that agitator, shake it till that comes loose. If it's still there, it shows that you still have some of the matting agent stuck to the bottom of the bottle. Because the matting agent is heavier than the sealer base, so it will slowly settle out. And if it sits around a lot, then it's going to, it's slowly coming up. You can see just a, that white, you can see a tiny bit. But you want that stuff fully in solution because that's what makes the sealer more matte. So you shake it until you can. And your Vortex mixer may help with this one. This is the only one that I feel you really need to get it in solution. So sometimes you can do this too to knock it free and see. This is a stubborn one. So yeah, you should, you never have to shake one of our normal paints this much. Not ever. The brush on sealer is the one exception because you really want all of that matting medium out of that bottom of the bottle. If you don't, then what happens is you use half the bottle and then as you shake it over time, that matting medium does come up eventually. There we go. You can see that one have been sitting around for a long time. I haven't used, this was a fresh bottle and it's been sitting around for like eight months. Um, but now once that bead is out, I can see the bubbles. I know that all my matting agent is in solution now. But yeah, that's the only Reaper paint that you have to do that with. And you shouldn't have to shake it that much if you use the bottle often. But anyway, if you leave it, then what happens is you use a lot of this, the actual base, but not as much of the flatting agent. And eventually your ratio gets off and you get frosted because you have too much matting agent then, you know, because as the bottle gets lower, there's more area for the fluid to get shaken in, right? So the agitation level is greater. And so then suddenly all that stuff on the bottom starts coming up into solution. But it, because there's, it's very powerful stuff, it will overpower the half a bottle of solution that you have left. So if you've ever had a bottle of Matt Sealer Frost, yeah, that's why. Um, we, uh, our policy is to add agitators to all of our paints, Grey Mouser. If you can't see it, it may be a light color. It may be white. 
But when I was, I, again, I always give this disclaimer. I'm no longer at the factory. I no longer run the paint department. But it was always our, always, always, always our policy to put agitators in every paint. And if you, if you don't have agitator in your paint, like get some glass beads and put one in because it, it really just helps. You shouldn't ever have to shake. Like, like I just did with that one. You shouldn't ever have to shake any of our normal paints. And part of that is the agitator working. Hello, Esther Jean. Did you not see it? Did you not see the pretty? I, uh, I announced it a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago. It happened actually a while ago, but uh, we he gave me the option to design the ring myself, so because he's a very smart man and awesome. So it took a while to get made then. Yes. Yeah, we haven't set a date yet. Everybody asks, well, when are you going to do it? We're like, eh, it's not a priority. <laughs> we were talking about it a bit this weekend, but... I think he'd rather keep it local, but I mostly think that neither one of us wants a big to-do. And so we're just like probably looking for a very low maintenance setup. Yeah, for those who didn't know, yeah, David proposed. The mini painter uh, unification is uh, on uh, en route. It is, uh, it's progressing. There we go. Uh, we're very unlikely to do that. No time. Um, uh, we just don't want, we just don't want to, we just don't want to do it. We don't want to have to coordinate that. We are going to have our parents and maybe, and my brother, and then each of us will have one friend invited. So... We also just got back from eight days in Hawaii, so we don't really need another vacation right now. Like, don't want to travel. Um, and we already maybe have a European trip planned for next year. So I did consider that, but I don't... Some of my, you know... It's not like everybody in your family or your friends have a ton of money, right? So... And we don't have the money to pay for all of them. So we can't really do that. I'm not even, I'm probably just going to get a Unitarian minister, or maybe we'll just do justice of the peace. Honestly, Shadow Spawn, neither one of us is terribly religious at this point. Um, but I think my parents would maybe like it if they got to come to a wedding. And my brother didn't, you know, last time I got hitched, didn't make it either. So yeah, name changing is the worst. I'll agree. That's the only part that leaves me less than thrilled. Oh, that was kind of our plan, Grey Mouser, because that's what the community asked. They asked if um, if we could at least have like a late uh, uh, wedding reception at ReaperCon for all of our painter friends. And we are both just fine for that. We aren't going to do all the, sh all the crap, though. Like, don't expect us to do dances and all that BS. That's part of why I've never believed in it, and I will not welcome it. So don't even plan it. Don't even plan it or you'll watch me walk out. And I'm not joking. <laughs> it's just what I, I don't believe in it. Oh, really? Name change is not allowed when you get married in Quebec. That's weird. <laughs> no, thanks, Cranston. I think I'll go for a justice of the peace. But we're fine having a party. We're fine having a party at ReaperCon. Not that everything isn't just a party at ReaperCon anyway. So it's just like, you know, whatever. But yeah, I am a pretty private person and I don't like a lot of spectacle or focus on me. Um, and especially on aspects of my life. So yeah, we're keeping it low key. Keeping it low key. I thought about maybe going down to Carmel here because he and I really love it. But then I could tell that he was less central with that because it's just going to get, it's going to be a getting everybody there, finding a place to put people up, yada, yada. So I probably just need to uh, spend some time and ask myself what I really want. Oh, good. Good basement. Yay. Yep. 
But yeah, actually, the more I think about it, the more I think Justice of the Peace with just a nice party, unless my... The thing is that David has never been married before, and so I'm pretty sure his parents would really appreciate a small ceremony. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. So that's probably... Much as, much as Justice of the Peace is attractive, um, we may just go Unitarian Minister. That's what... Very simple, very, very fast, very short. Yeah, exactly, Grey Mouser. Yeah, that's true, Ferrisian. Yeah, exactly right. Hello, Luminary. How's it going? Luminary Abyss. That's a cool name. We are putting just a quick little base coat on our ogre, and I'm almost done with it. I just wanted to get all the skin done so we could really work on him. Um, but uh, we're doing the classical first edition ogre, so uh, very yellowy, very ochre uh, kind of skin tone. I actually uh, used Reaper Ogre skin, but it's very, very yellow. And so when I have a very, very colorful monster skin, I tend to like to mix it with a normal skin tone. So I mixed it with tan skin, um, just to kind of mute it down a little bit. And I, I'm pretty happy with the tone I ended up with. It's very yellow, but once I start to add highlights, it's going to be not nearly as bad. But it lets us explore how to deal with some of these very heavily colored, weird colored, alien colored skin tones. That and our knoll that we're working on, our knoll pirate, he's greenish. So it's a nice opportunity to work on that. All right, got all that. And I was just talking earlier also when you're base coating, make sure you actually use a lot of paint. Don't uh, don't use a tiny bit of paint on your brush and try to get it to do that way. You'll actually show brush strokes more, chances are, than if you use a lot of paint on your brush and kind of glob it on and spread it around. Um, a little extra paint if you are thinning your paint is not gonna hurt the model and uh, it'll give you a smoother base coat. Yeah, Astro, my parents are so, okay. My mom knows I'm gonna do what I wanna do. My dad tends to sulk a little bit about that, but it's true. So um, my parents, and plus, you know, I've already been married once, unlike David, but David's parents, I'm pretty sure, you know, would really like a small ceremony, so. Nice, Twisted Oma. Eh, I'm not a fan of like, okay, it's cold out there, Pendrake. I don't know if you have been to the San Francisco Bay, but if you have, it's freaking cold on the water. Uh-uh. <laughs> I don't want, remember, I don't want a production number. I just want to get married. Somewhere nice. A park. Maybe somewhere in the city. I don't know, but I don't really want a public ceremony. And that's the thing. I don't want to have people wandering by. Like, you know going, what's going on? I just, I don't. I am, I am a very private person. So anything that involves a spectacle, and especially because I'm not a boat person necessarily, it's just not up for, I'm not just not up for it. Like if we had already, like if we had planned a Hawaiian vacation next year, like I would be, I would be, I would think about it. But again, it's going to be expensive. And if I want my, one of my friends to come who is not high income, like then we need to pay to get that person there. You know, it's just, it creates all sorts of logistic and kind of uncomfortable like things where you're asking people to pay a lot of money to attend your wedding. I just, I don't like that feeling. So it's enough to ask them to fly to San Francisco. And you know what? San Francisco has the advantage that when my brother and the kids come, there's lots of stuff to see. So, you know, it's not, I live in a destination city now, or I live near, I live near to a destination city now. So it's, uh, it's not like I'm asking them to come out to the middle of nowhere. There's definitely like cool things in the area if they come out. That's pretty cool. Oh, that's pretty cool with the Falcon. Yeah. It's like people have fun with their weddings, right? I've just never been that type of girl. Like, I have friends who that was, like, their thing. Like, they really wanted to plan every aspect of an amazing wedding. Like, that was their thing. 
But I was just, I was just never that person. I was amazed enough that anybody wanted to marry me. <laughs> yeah, right? Right, Shadow Spawn? You're like, oh, it's on the coast. And if you're like me and you've always been down to like, you know, Georgia to the boardwalk or you're in, you know, um, like Florida or you're down on uh, the Gulf Coast, you know, or Caribbean, you think ocean is warm and nice and there are palm trees. And then you go to San Francisco, you're like, oh, it's so cold. <laughs> It's terrible. <laughs> Who made this ocean? What were they thinking? <laughs> yeah, see? See, nice. Something like iffy, you nailed it. That's the kind of thing I would do. Hello, mouse. Yeah, it's freaking cold. But yeah, I like that one, iffy. Thank you. Yeah, he's, uh, we're just starting to block in these dramatic shadows. So I just had to finish the base coat because last time, last time I wanted to get to a more exciting part of the stream. So I just base coated this area so that I could start showing people kind of the drama. Um. <laughs> no time for bull. You're funny. That's, it figures, right? It is the best laid plans of bulls and men will often go awry. Yeah. His reception in the park and you got the courthouse with limited guests. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Canada. In Canada, yes, I bet. Funny. All right. So cool. Let me get our, and this, in case you couldn't, you didn't catch that. This is definitely a metal model. He is a chonk. He is a uh, dark heaven, so he is a traditional white metal casting. But he also comes in bones. They were just out of him in bones, so I didn't uh, I didn't get him in bones. But you can get this sculpt a lot cheaper than <laughs> than this. <laughs> Alrighty, so let's get this oxide brown going on. It's one of our new Kickstarter colors. However, if you are looking for other colors um, to work. These are okay. Like, they're not quite as dark as you can see. Harvest Brown is very orange, so it'll go with the yellow skin tone. Tarnished Copper has a bit more red and yellow in it. Um, these colors both will work just fine as shaders for this skin tone. They're not quite as dark as the Oxide, and they're not quite as heavily pigmented. Um, but these will work. So will Ruddy Leather, 9109, will also work. Although that may be, it may mute your shadows a bit because it has some black in it. Oxide brown doesn't have any. So let's see. It's a one to one with my base coat and oxide brown. So when I'm mixing these sort of progressions, it's pretty much the same mouse. I mean, once you prime the metal, it's it's exactly like painting on anything else, right? Same as resin. Usually it's the prep work. Like if you're gonna, there we go. So I'd count that as one drop. And two drops, then I'm going to drop two drops in here. One. And I'm going to watch this brown completely overpower the uh, yellow because uh, the oxides are such strong pigments. Oh, except not as dark as I thought it would be. I did one to one. Maybe I just uh, put a little bit more base coat in this time. Yeah, leather set what you use for non-leathery things, right? Yeah, but as far as prep goes, I like resin the best. There we go. That's much better. Much closer. I'm going to kind of dab it onto my card, which remember I did a card to uh, keep track. These are little watercolor cards. They're artist trading cards. It's watercolor paper, so it takes uh, paint as long as you don't like totally saturate it which would cause it to bend and warp. Um, but it takes uh, Master Series paint just fine. Um, so I'll write down my mix and then I'll put a swatch down and that will help me to match what I did previously. Yeah, the way the primer, I mean, like you say, the primer over metal does feel maybe a little bit different than over, uh, over plastic. 
But yeah, once you've got the base down though, it's, it's all the same, except the metal is more likely to chip because of the weight and the hardness of the surface. So if you go around dinging it on stuff like I was, I'm gonna put just a little bit more of this oxide in there. Yeah, there we are. I just want it to be nice and dark. I, I want a dark shadow if you're gonna suggest a, a really strong light source like this to get these dramatic shadows, then you need a very uh, dark shadow. Yeah, I mean, he's heavy. If I really felt like it, I could grab some, what I usually use is bubble wrap to cradle a model like this, but since he has a big base and it's pretty easy to hold on to, I'm just doing that. It's not too bad. I mean, it maybe gets old after, you know, the hour and a half stream, but it's only an hour and a half, so. All right, so let's look at our lighting here. I had blocked in some shadows here and here and here, and I was kind of looking at, just looking at my shadows. I'm using my giant ring light, which is up here, right right behind my little face cam. Um, using my giant ring light, because it's the stronger of my two lights here. Three lights, if you count the open window. Um, and it, it'll cast enough of a shadow for me to see where I should be shading. And it's nice when you've got an overhead lamp of some sort. I could also do it by just putting it up under my overhead lamp over here. Uh, you guys can't really see it, but there. So I could also do it that way. As long as you've got a light that's strong enough that you can see how the natural shadows are falling, kind of base your uh, the way you're shading on that. I'm gonna actually switch to a real brush though. This one is my Craptastic brush. And it is not precise, which is not a deal breaker when you're just blocking in shadows, but I get a kind of annoyed with it. Oh, it's really good if you just cut it up into card sizes, like, and cutting it up into trading card sizers, lovely, uh, lovely Dova. If you, if you are like working on a project and you tend to like, like me, like you tend to put down a project and then pick it up again a week or two or two months later, um, you can actually keep like a card binder, just like magic cards and just put these little guys in there. Um, and then you've got it, you organize, organize it by color or by type of model or whatever you want to do. Um, do a little index in the front if you're really anal, which a lot of us mini painters are. Uh, and it makes it really easy to just uh, keep your references. And then also when you're looking for ideas, maybe for a totally different model, you can go through and look at all the mixes and stuff you've done in the past and maybe springboard off of a past color combo that you did that you actually really liked but had forgotten. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of good reasons. Just cut it, uh, I think these are two and a half by four, three by four, I don't remember. But it's a standard trading card size. And they sell them in packs and they're really cheap, but if you already have tons of watercolor paper from school, yeah, cut it up. It's really useful. It's Some people take pictures on their phones and do folders and some people use apps. Um, I like having the physical, actual colors. I find the apps are less useful for me because I like to see the color, like as it was swatched. So for me, judging like color like that and making sure that my new color is the same as my old color, like it, it just, I can see the difference here. So I do like having a swatch, especially cause I do so many mixes. So, but a lot of people really like the apps like paint rack and others that where you can save like your projects and save the colors. That's also very useful. And some people use both. And the bottom line, as with all aspects of miniature painting is, do what works for you. So let's look at our model here. I'm gonna kind of tilt him until I think I've got, there we go. So look at this hand down here. See how really it's just the light is hitting it a couple places. I'm gonna hold this in position so I can see my shadows and I'm just gonna block them in. Like exactly as I'm seeing it, I'm gonna put shadows everywhere that I see the shadows. Then I'm gonna come in with my base coat while I've still got a little bit of wet. And I'm gonna blend it a little bit. Wet blending, wet blending is when you're working with two colors wet and you're blending them together at the edges. You're taking advantage. You're, you're trying to use oils like acrylics, essentially, or sorry, acrylics like oils. You're trying to uh, do the wet. You have to do it faster. Wet blending isn't a necessary technique. I, it's not one of the ones I would say is you must learn it. 
but it is extremely useful. So if you can work with it enough to get, or if you have a knack for it, if you discover you have a knack for it, it can be extremely useful in your process. So yeah, so now I just used my light sourcing to block in the shadows on my hand, just looking at my light. It was really useful. So if you don't know where to put shadows and you are trying to like do something other than just put a wash down and then, you know, highlight the parts that stick out, you know, which is the very basic approach and there's nothing wrong with it. It just gives you a very different effect. But if you're trying to get more like natural, like you want to, you want this dramatic light sourcing, you want it to really look like the light is shining on the ogre and is getting some really harsh shadows. Um, then that's when you want to use a reference light and just kind of tilt your model until you can see the shadows where they're falling and then paint what you see. So here I have a light over on this side as well. So I'm getting a little bit of a reflected light, but that's okay because light would still reflect from everything around the ogre. So if I'm getting a little bit more light in some areas that aren't related to my big first primary light source, that's actually quite natural. Yep, using a notebook also works well. I used to use kind of a little watercolor notebook. But I, I realized that the notebook, like, it's page by page. Whereas when I do these cards and I put them in an organizer, I can get nine projects on one page. So I can, I can find things much easier, faster. It's all what, what makes you happy. It's really what makes you happy. What, whatever your inner organizer geek likes is what you should do. Whatever system, when you take out your little color book, if it makes you happy to page through it and look at the projects until you get to the one that you were looking for, do it. Like, go there. Whatever makes you happy and excited to paint. It, that should be the goal of everything, right? Becoming happy and excited to paint. I'm just, there we go. So I'm looking at the leg here, which is a, a hard, I guess I'll kind of tilt it like that. But I've got a pretty hard shadow coming down from the loincloth, which is hard for you, you guys can see that dark line kind of. Um, pretty hard shadow coming down there. That's pretty angular. And then... Uh, I have a heavy shadow on the inside of the leg as well. So if I want to keep with my overall shading, I also have to take a really hard look here. His necklace is definitely casting a shadow. You see it? So I need to like, look at my, there we go. I got to look at that. And this is also get his whole head is casting this shadow. Do you see it? See this shadow right here. So let's actually block that in. That's going to help us get that idea. And I'm using a lot of paint again, using a big blob of paint. Now the harder, like the brighter the light, the more intense the light, the more you want to leave a harder edge on your shadows and the less you want to blend them. Under bright sunlight, shadows, as you know, have a hard edge. You can see shapes really easily. But under more diffused light, so if this was an intense but cloudy day, we would have more of a fade, right? I'm keeping some pretty sharp. I'm thinking about working for some really sharp edges here, as long as everything looks correctly. The thing about doing a hard edge shadow is that it puts a lot more pressure on you. You have to make sure the shape looks right and you also like have to be precise with it, right? It can't be in the wrong place or it's gonna look totally wrong. So ups the stakes. Doing, doing like a sunlit hard edge shadow ups the stakes for your mini painting. It calls on you to do some real assessment of what you're doing with shadow. It could be a justification to be, you always have to like, as a mini painter and as a human, you always have to kind of like look hard at yourself, right? On those, at those moments, like, is this really like a cool challenge that I set for myself every time? Or am I just used to working this way? And so it's a comfort to me to work this way because I know what I'm doing. You know, it's like, it, you have to ask yourself. I mean, the real test is to try to make it easier for yourself and see if your enjoyment level goes down. But if your enjoyment level doesn't go down and you still like, you're still happy with your painting, 
then I would say that it's a crutch <laughs> or a habit. Oh, cool, Frisian. Yeah, it gives you a different effect, Luminary, to go. And I do both. Um, I start dark and work light on certain things. Uh, but in a lot of, uh, when I'm using a mid-tone or a, or a lighter mid color, I do tend to add shadows. Especially, you could do it either way for this dramatic lighting thing. Like, I've done both. Uh, I wonder if I have my, I don't have my Sergio model around, but I, when Sergio Calvo Rubio from Spain was here teaching at, um, when we were down in Texas, he does a very dramatic shadow style, but he starts dark and works light. Always he starts dark and then works up. And he uses a lot of layers of paint to do it because you've got to like build up those lighter colors all the way from that really close to black shadow. So it takes a long time. I think that sometimes I move more in this direction because I actually find it a little bit quicker. Uh, I find that working, I used to work everything dark to light and it did take me a long time to build up from the shadow where I find it's faster to move the shadow over a mid-tone and do a quick blend. So it's all a style. You should always try everything, like try a, a range of tactics and just decide what suits you. And it may very well suit you just to keep it dark and work to light. And it does give a certain depth to your model then because you, you are always doing a dark shadow, like you're always starting from that dark shadow. Whereas it can be a challenge sometimes to push yourself to shade darker when you start lighter. So it, play around, play around. It'll give you very different effects. Actually, we just did that. I demonstrated it here. It's not as, uh, as uh, evident. But the null paw, what, whether you start dark or mid, is going to change the color of the model. Like, discernibly change the effect you get. So this is Noel. We worked on him on Friday. And if you haven't watched this VOD, you may want to go watch it because it's really evident the starting darker versus starting lighter earlier in the process. I introduced these boards and that's brought the paws closer together. But this paw was started dark and we worked it up. And this paw was started light and we worked it down and up. And both of these paws use exactly the same colors. Except I've added a slightly higher highlight here because we started lighter. So I needed to add a lighter highlight because it was a lighter color, lighter base. Um, but otherwise, as far as the shading goes and otherwise, as far as the colors go, everything is the same except for that slightly brighter off-white highlight on the one paw. So you can see the difference still in how starting with a dark base coat versus starting with a light base coat with the same colors changes it. Now, if you use washes, you'll get a slightly different effect because the wash will essentially mimic starting with a dark base coat because it's going to lay a layer of pigment over the entire thing. So the brightness and vibrancy of the color that you got initially by going light is going to dim when you put a wash over it. And then since you're taking that dark wash and trying to build colors on top of it, it's exactly almost as if you had started with a darker color and we're now building colors. So it's uh, it gives you very different effects. So yeah, this is still on our Twitch VODs, I'm pretty sure. And eventually it will be on the Reaper YouTube, but it's the first, it's the, uh, it's the first time we painted this guy. So 30038. And you will always be able to find it. Once it goes off of VODs, it'll be on YouTube. Oh, good. Yay. Yeah, I'm going to be referring to that one a lot, Quindy. We'll see. But yeah, so it does make a difference what you start with. You will get a different effect. I um, Actually, I can show you one more, I think. Yeah, I can show you one more example. Hold on. Because I still have Sphinx and I still have... Uh, sorry. One second. So here's another example of that for you, Luminary. So dark skin tones. Zari here, she's a Reaper uh, Bard model. She's got that great golden brown skin tone, right? And then we've got Sphinxy. And Sphinxy has a much darker tone. These were painted with the same colors. One of them started with a blue black, like ebony flesh, which is a really, really dark bluish brown. I don't know if I've got it. Do I've got it? Yeah. So ebony flesh, that's really dark. 
the other one, let's see if I can find the color. Zari was started with ruddy flesh. These are the two uh, essentially African bones, skin tones. They're both very good. Um, yeah, yeah. Sounds good. And so starting with the ruddy flesh on her, even though I shaded with the darker color, still gives me a lighter skin tone than this model where I started with the ebony flesh and I layered it up pretty heavily with that ruddy flesh. You can see the color there on her cheekbones and on the forehead. But because the undercoat is so different, the colors look different. So just another example of how starting with more of a middle color and working up and down gives you a different effect than working entirely from dark to light. And again, if you did a wash, that would be different. If I had done a wash of ebony flesh over Zari's face and hands, it would have brought it, it would essentially have created a different, a different base coat. Because then you have to work your highlights and your midtones back up over that. So you're working over a dark again, and you've darkened everything down. It would have ended up looking more like Sphinx. That's why I avoid washes, actually. If I want it, if I want a dark base coat that I have to work over, I'll just start dark. I find that they cost me time. So anyway, Zari, Zari and Staccato, her buddy, have not been on screen for a while, so I thought I would bring them back. And they, they live up on my bookshelf. There. So that was an easy grab. Jazzy on. I've said this before, but shouldn't you be in bed? <laughs> or is it still like, it's still decent where you are. Like you're exactly 12 hours off from us, aren't you? Oh, okay. <laughs> but puppy. <laughs> Funny. So anyway, I hope that helped Luminary. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Awesome. I'm glad to hear it. I'm always glad to be useful. Yes. And, and I'm glad you're enjoying the Patreon. Like, uh, I actually, I'll take this opportunity to just plug it and then Quindy can get all of her links out of the way. I have a Patreon. It's cool. Um, and I'm about to put something up on painting bones just for October. And then I'm uh, going to be doing orange for my pentads uh, coming up. And I've been working both on, on both of those PDFs actually all weekend. So my Patreon is patreon.com slash painting big. I do a lot on color, a lot on color because it's a lot. It's kind of my superpower. So if you use MSP or even if you don't and you're just interested in colors, uh, give it a look. I have some free stuff over there. If you are doing MSP, I have a free handout for the class I did at ReaperCon a while ago, uh, thinning MSP paints. So if you're just trying to figure out what MSP is all about, you can go and give that a look. And there's the, the class, yes. There we go, we get all the links out of the way. Yeah, see, that's the thing, Mouse. That's what totally made me like realize that washes weren't for me. I tended to not do washes anyway because I was coming from two-dimensional art. So I was used to having to paint in shadows or draw in shadows, as the case may be. And then I learned washes, and for a while I liked them. But then I realized when I really, really got, you know, started painting more, it became very evident to me that it actually cost me time that it was not actually a quick technique. The only time washes are a quick technique is if you're using like, like contrast paint over like white primer, or maybe you're using, um, you're using something where you just put one, one coat and then you're done, like with maybe a little highlight. But a, like most people using washes are using something that does discolor the base color. And so touching that up can cost you time. So it's all, it's all in what, you, what you're trying to do and, and how fast you're trying to paint. Like with gaming models, I totally use washes. Like if I have to get a monster on the table for D&D or I have to, you know, paint something quick for playing a game, then I will absolutely use washes um, and I'll just use them really thin and I'll try to minimize the amount of time they cost me. But I'm not doing a lot of highlighting on those models. I'm maybe just hitting them with one highlight. So it's not costing me a lot of time. And even then I gravitate toward lighter washes, like lighter weight washes. I tend to start dark work light on terrain, actually, Frisian, to create that depth. I find that with dry brushing, especially on buildings and stippling, um, if I start with black primer, I can just build stuff up. It looks great. Yeah, for sure. 
washes on true metallic metals. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's see here. Let's again look at our shadows and highlights here. There's my shadows. Yeah, I've got an extreme shadow here. Got an extreme shadow here. I've got a shadow that comes under there. Trying to hold my model where I need it. There we go. And we've got a shadow here, here. Got a bunch of shadow in here. So I'm trying to block in some stuff here. Kind of get an idea for how my light is moving. I'm a little bit off centered here. So that's why the shadow on the head is dropping a little bit this way. That's a sign that because it's not dropping straight down, it's the sign the light is just a little bit off, off kilter. And when the head is turned, that's a good strategy. Having a straight up and down light can be very uh, boring on a static model. So it may help you to, uh, to put it just a little off center. For me, it naturally becomes off center because my light is slightly off center. So, uh, yes, coops, but it's a mix. It's a mix. I always, when I've got a really over like colored skin tone, I like to throw it on a humanoid. I like to throw human skin tone into it. So it's a two to one. So this is a little less yellow than your traditional ogre skin. And as I apply these brown tones, you see it shifting even less yellow. Like it looks very yellow down there. It looks less yellow here. It's starting to turn brown as I add more and more brown tones. And then as I come in with highlights, that's going to change the look of the ogre, just like it changed the look of the null feet when we were working on those on Friday. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, for tabletop, I absolutely use washes. It's very, um, if I can get it exactly right, if you use a very light color and you use a dark wash, you can essentially create a mid-tone highlight shadow in one go and then just do a little bit of a highlight touch-up, you're done. Right, for tabletop. Um, but most of the painting I do is not for tabletop. It's more for display, for Reaper, or for competition. So I really don't want to be stuck kind of because the base coat is like the longest process and the most boring, arguably, um, in many ways, you really don't want to be stuck there. Right. I'm going to just add in a little bit of extra shadows here. Now, whenever you've got like just a shallow kind of recess, like here on the stomach, where it's just like ripples of pudge, you don't want to make it near as dark here, but you still want to bring in that suggestion. So you want to do maybe a mix, a spot mix of your uh, shadow and your, your uh, highlight so that it's not as bad. Yeah, people, um, when we did a poll coups, they wanted me to use the traditional first edition, like ogre yellow color. But yeah, I always will mix a normal skin tone into like anything, goblin skin, kobold scale, kobold scale anything like that if I'm doing it. Um, I like to have for humanoids, just even with trolls, I like to mix a flesh tone into the green uh, and get, get it a little bit less like crayon, you know? So this is yellow, but I feel like as I work on this, especially if I mix another skin tone in to highlight, I'm going to shift it more away from that yellow color, but we're still going to get that traditional ogre, ochre skin tone that first edition D&D had. Yep, it is. It is. Yeah, Ron is a fan. Ron created the concept swatches for these colors in the Dungeon Dwellers. And so he is a big first edition D&D guy. He prefers first. And first edition ogres were, that's why our goblin skin is orange. First edition goblins are orange and kobold scale is red. First edition kobolds were red. So that's why all those exist. But if you, if you like that idea, but you don't want it to be quite so yellow or quite so orange or quite so et cetera, et cetera, um, that's why mixing in a normal humanoid skin tone when you're working on humanoids with colored skin tones can, can help um, make it look more natural, right? Like I can believe this skin tone. Like this is believable skin tone for me. 
Uh, and as I add more shadows and highlights, it will only become more so. Yeah, it's still extremely ochre. You can't get away from it. I mean, it's still a two to one. I only mixed in two drops of tan skin to four drops of the ogre skin. So the yellow and the ochre are definitely going to overpower. But it also, it did mute it. It darkened it. And it took it like more of a golden rod color. Um, no, actually, not all of them have the metal tab. This These guys do. You can always just, uh, it, for a metal model, you for this something this heavy, you'd need to pin it. So if you were, you could put it on a round plastic base, you'd want to, you have two options. You can either, hmm. So when you see the tab, I actually cut out the center section here. So he just had like two pegs. So you could either cut a hole in your plastic base to fit and just shove the pegs through it and glue it just like this, but just like little holes in your, in your round plastic base. Um, with a, you could put, use a pin vise or a, or a saw or something to do that. Uh, it's a, it's difficult though. What I tend to do instead is I would cut off the, the tab entirely and use a pin vise and wire, brass wire, which you can get just for beads. Um, and I would essentially drill holes in the bottom of his feet, put the wire through, drill holes in the base and connect him that way. And then I would use green putty, sculpting putty, to also kind of tack in and, and solidify that connection. I would pack it around his feet, just around the bottom, to help, uh, let's see, do I have another model that I've done that on right now? No, I do not, but I have a base. So I would pack this, I would build up, like maybe I would build up a couple rocks next to his, or pebbles next to his feet, because this stuff is sticky, and it's also, um, when it sets, it's plasticky. So it'd help give his feet more of a kind of a place to sit um, and do that kind of thing. It's a little more work, but it also has the advantage of like really giving you some ground cover. Like you can add in, you know, pebbles, sculpt some pebbles and stones and maybe even a big rock that he's just has his foot next to. All of that will help to keep this heavy model on the base with the pins. When you stick the pins through the plastic, you can also bend them over and putty them, putty the, bo the bottom. And that will also help anchor everything. Um, so yeah, they would add dog faces in first edition. Gray Mouser. I liked kobolds when they yipped. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. sure. Go for it, Coops. But yeah, so it is a little bit of work with, with this heavy model. Like if this was a normal human model and I was just pegging it on, then, you know, not nearly as bad. You know, if it was something little like Duelist here, um, then it's not nearly as bad. The other option you have is if it has an integral base, um, like she did, I just puttied all around it. Like I, I, that's why she's got this step, the curb that she's standing on, is that actually part of this is her integral base and part of it is just my green stuff extending it. You just can't tell because I've sculpted it right up to that base and then put an extra ornamental edge on it to suggest she's standing on a cobblestone curb in the city. So there's all sorts of ways to deal with basing. Super glue. Usually for pinning, I like the Zappa Gap medium because it flows into the holes a little bit. Um, for other gluing, I use Loctite. As long as you have a medium, it doesn't matter really the brand. I like Zappa Gap, but whatever brand works for you. Um, hold on and make a note actually, cause I need to order more Zappa Gap. My Zappa Gap is, uh, expiring, but yeah, it's super glue to it. Once you have the holes drilled and you only need a little bit of a hole, you usually only go up to like the first little bit of your drill that, that couple of millimeters. Cause if you go too far in with a tiny drill like this, it's going to snap. I have a risk to snap off. Um, and then the wire I use is pretty thin too. But you stick, you put a bit dot of glue in there, you stick the wire in, you snip it off with a side cutter, and then you drill the holes in the base and you stick the ogre on there. And then, like I said, bend over the wires and putty them on or glue them. Putty is better probably. See, I do not recommend accelerator, especially for a big model like this, Jazzyon. And the reason that I do not is that it makes the super glue more brittle. And with a very heavy model like this, I would worry about that. For a normal human size model, yeah, accelerator's just fine. But not for a big heavy metal one. Woohoo. 
But yeah, never worry about like um never worry about distracting me. Like I I'm on a, I'm on a squirrel train today anyway. Squirrel. Um but this show is about educating and it's not just talking about advanced stuff like the more advanced shading we're doing right now. It's also to answer basic questions that you guys have about miniature painting in general and also Reaper products. So never be afraid to ask a basic question. You are not derailing the stream. This is part of why the stream exists. And I'm happy when you guys do ask questions because then, you know, it gives me something to talk about while I'm doing maybe boring stuff like base coding. So yeah, if you pin with paper, paper clips, make sure you have a real wire cutters that is rated for spring steel as many paper clips are spring steel and they will shatter a normal hobby cutter. And I do not joke, they will shear the metal. The metal will shear off. It may hurt you. Make sure you always use eye protection. Um, but be careful with that. That's, that's the only thing about paper clips. I found that out the hard way when my friend who borrowed my clippers essentially ruined them by using them on a paper clip that was spring steel. She was used to heavy duty wire cutters and did not know there was a difference in the hardness rating of a hobby product versus a real tool. Yeah, so, so essentially do use whatever you want. Just make sure you have the appropriate tool to cut that material. And any hobby store side cutter is only gonna be good for plastic and thin brass pretty much. Thin brass, thin aluminum. No, it was not. It wasn't the super. It was. It was fairly cheapo hobby cutters, but they still, you know, were my only set. And then they had big, big triangle gouges in them. They didn't shear, thank God, but they, uh, they were wrecked. They were wrecked. Oh, you've got the nice gunpla ones. No, I've got. I've got the Games Workshop ones. I like them. They're they're serviceable. But I'm only ever cutting brass and uh, brass and plastic. So and maybe resin. So it's uh, they're adequate. Yeah, just a normal wire cutter. Like a good quality wire cutter at a hardware store will be rated for spring steel, pretty much. Alrighty, so we've got those blocked in. I feel like we need a darker shadow here. Let me see, line this up. See how that dark shadow is falling right in there? That means we need to make it all dark in there. Dark, very dark. Doesn't mean we can't put some highlights in, but when we start, we should start with that shadow. And I'm using a warm color to shade here, which is uh, unusual and there's a reason for it, but we'll maybe talk about that a little bit. I think I talked about it a little bit before. Oh no, pruning shears. Your friend's GW one's rusted and, and died, huh? Yeah, I'm in a really dry climate now, so mine are like really dry climate. Mine are still pristine. I had lost my um, previous side cutters and I was just like in a hurry. I think I was off to some convention. So I marched into the Games Workshop store in Denton because I was in Texas at the time and, and announced to everybody, to the manager who was a friend, hey, Brett, I need you to sell me a, a pair of exorbitantly expensive side cutters. And he's like, done. <laughs> Yeah, as long as you've got like good metal cutters, yeah. Yeah, for sure, you don't want it flying. You don't want that stuff flying through the air. Not when you have animals around or small children or large children, unless they're really not in favor right now. <laughs> but you probably still don't want to. All right, so there we go. So we've got hard shadow there, hard shadow there. Need to look. This is gonna cast actually a shadow over this whole shoulder because of this club. So this is again a paint what I see. Hold it up in the appropriate position. 
and look at where the shadows fall and then paint what you see. Also, it's worth mentioning that the farther away from the, from the area, the softer the shadow gets. So like, I'm getting a bit of a fuzzy shadow cast from this. It's got a little bit of a fuzzy edge. You can kind of see it. Um, whereas the shadow that I'm getting here, going down from this gauntlet, is actually very hard. Um, likewise, with the head shadow, it's a little softer around the edges, whereas the shadow directly under this tendon is very hard. So shadows tend to fuzz and fade uh, the farther away the thing is from the surface. And you can see that with tree, tree branches. If you walk on a sunny day, if you walk along a path that has tree branches going overhead, and you will see that tree branches closer are casting a sharper shadow or bushes and then the tree branches farther away are casting a very diffused shadow. James Gurney has a video online, I think it's his Painting Dinosaurs video, where he, where he demonstrates this as he's uh, painting a, a cover for National Geographic. Um, and he's trying to give those branch, the shadows of the vegetation on the dinosaurs. Uh, so he's essentially out there showing you how he figures that out. James Gurney, for those who don't know it, has written one of the best art books for use in miniatures ever. Um, it's a 2D art book, but always useful, called Light and Color. He has a very simplified teaching style. I love his work. Uh, he's the guy who did Dinotopia. So he has, a, and does covers for National Geographic. So, you know, he's got chops. He knows his stuff. Uh, and he also has the most beautiful artist studio on the planet. Oh, Bergala, thank you. Five months. Awesome. You're getting up there. You're almost to your half a subversary. Yeah, cheap cutters are known to shear as well. Good point. Yeah, I mean, okay, when it comes down to hobbies where you're dealing with things like cutting metal or anything like that, or even, you know, I always say with your painting, with brush quality and everything, with art, you get what you pay for. There's a reason, there's a, there's a point where you, where you're, where things are getting expensive and it may not be worth it. There definitely is overpricing, but there's also super cheap stuff is super cheap and it's not going to give you the effects and, you know, the, the results, uh, that you are looking for without a battle and sometimes never like cheap brushes are a good example of this. You can do only so much with cheap brushes. And if you really decide you want to be able to hit those tiny details and do awesome blends and little textures and stuff like that, you need a brush like this. You need, and it's not a super expensive brush. It's a 15 to $20 brush. That's not like a deal breaker when it lasts for years, but trying to do that with a $2 brush, unless you get super lucky with a super cheap sable that just somehow managed to be constructed pretty well, you're just not going to be able to do it. I mean, there are exceptions. There are people who paint miniatures with toothpicks and make it look amazing. So you're always going to get, you know, you can compensate with skill for the quality or of your tool, right? You can learn to work around it. But all that work that you spent learning to work around a tool that's not ideal could have been work that you spent on, you know, learning to use a good tool well. So you've got a question, you know, what's your priority here? Just make sure that you're actually, you know, you're aware of what you're doing and that, you know, you've got a question like the time that you spend, is this really how I want to be spending my time? Time is your most finite resource. You can't get it back once you spent it. All right, so deep shadow underneath that club. I do have a little bit of the fleshy part of the thumb and the hand there sticking out a bit. And I'll kind of judge how much I really want to keep of that. I'm thinking there's probably pretty shadowy here because this is actually back a little bit and underneath that club. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I have way too many brushes and I still want more. All right, let's get this going on here. We've got a pudgy, a pudgy bit of pudge over there. Pudgy, make a pudgy. 
the ogre. He's like, this is all muscle, thank you. How dare you body shame me? All right, we'll stop body shaming the ogre. It's all muscle. It's solid, solid muscle under this. There we go. So now we've got some definition. It's much lighter weight. We're not taking as heavy of a shadow. Here you're just suggesting a little bit of shadow. It's a very shallow shadow, so the it's not going to be near as dark as some of your deep shadow. So we're getting close to the end of the stream. Wow, time has flown on this one. Sometimes I'm just having fun, especially when I'm working on some, a new technique like this with the harder shadows. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the warm shadows. So when you get warm shadow, you get it with a really warm golden sunlight and you get it in an area where you're surrounded by a warmer color. So if he was out on a lawn or in a forest, you'd expect these shadows to be cool. Not, not this warm brown. You'd expect them to be a lot colder, maybe even greenish or just a little bit more muted um, because the shadow is under a blue sky in a sunlit area when you're surrounded by cooler colors tend to emulate those colors. So your shadows might have touches of green in them in a forest um, under a blue sky when you're out on a mountainside surrounded by gray and beige rocks, the shadows may be blue, um, you know, because your sky reflection comes in. So... Technically, if you're going for more of a realism thing, then you should think about that. You should think about the color of your shadows. Um, it's kind of an advanced technique, but it's actually something even a beginner can think of. Uh, so what I'm going to do for this guy then is when I build up a base for him, I'm probably going to make it like a warm reddish brown, like kind of like the red dirt and the, and the red, the oxide, like really rusty colored rocks. <laughs> and that will essentially explain why he's got all these really warm brownish shadows on him because you're going to get a lot of that, that kind of reflected from the area around him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is a metal one, Jimmy. Uh, I was going to order the bones one, but they were out. And so I was like, oh, well, I really want to paint this model. So I'm going to order the, the metal one. So it's the 3712. He's a chonk. He is serious. And hello, it's been a while. Yeah, we're doing the warm shadow thing. I wanted to do more of a dramatic lighting on this guy because with all these muscles, this kind of model, guys, is really good for dramatic shading and highlighting because you've got all these muscle masses. And so you can really go to town on making the muscles stand out and bringing them all out when you do a, a heavy shadow um, with a strong light source. So this kind of thing and just like big ripped barbarians and stuff like that. Uh, orcs and all those heavily muscled models that have a lot of skin showing are really good for really hard um, highlights and shadows. Yeah, you got it. It's because it requires a lot of thought, right, Jazian? Although I'm going to cheat because, you know, since I started painting him, I can totally like build in the uh, environment later. I can make my call then. So... Yeah, airbrushes. Yeah, he does look good in metal, I know. Because <laughs> he's just a great model. I mean, Bobby did a fantastic job on these guys. Uh, he's got a great expression. And he's just got he's, it's really nice details. It's fantastic. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. I'm already having fun, so that's always a good sign. Um, but yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, airbrushing does save time if you're an airbrusher. I am not yet an airbrusher. Um, I'll probably end up taking one of Aaron's classes just to make myself get... Uh, more comfortable with my Reaper Vex. We've just been so darn busy that I got I got a Reaper Vex at ReaperCon and I, and then we went on vacation <laughs> two weeks later. So I haven't had any time to set up an airbrush station in the garage like we've wanted to do. Um, and I haven't had any time to practice. Right, exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's, yeah, you got to really think about it. And then it helps to actually have kind of that lighting, like where you can, what David does, and he's super smart, Jazz, yeah, when you're using a non-conventional light color like that, what he'll do is actually look up a swatch of that color on the internet, and then he'll blow it up to be full screen on his phone and he'll hold it up. 
So if he's doing a pinkish purple light, he'll just find that color, a swatch of that color on the internet, like zoom in on it so it takes up his entire phone face, and then he'll hold his phone and see what the light, how the light looks hitting the model and how it reflects. Yeah, because we've got these beautiful phones, right? And they emit light, so why not use it? So yeah, that's what he does. It's super simple and easy. It takes him just a second, and he just will double check it. And he'll save the swatch to his photos so that he can pull it up anytime. Yeah, my my guy is uh is a smart. He's got he's got smarts. Yeah, you could totally do colored gels. If you've got LEDs sitting around, you can do the same thing with that. It just limits you a little more to whatever color gels you've got, but chances are you've got a basic selection and that's going to just be fine. Because, um, you know, if you need a purple gel and you've got one that's slightly pinker than you like, you can still use it and just substitute your purple color in. It'll give you roughly the same effect. Yeah, David is David is super good with it. Alrighty. I'm thinking we're we're so close to done. I'm trying to figure out if there's anything else. I think I need to shade this entire side of the face, though. I'm going to put this here. Yeah, yeah, even the cheekbone. Even though it's tempting to leave his cheekbone lighter because that's what we like to do on faces, on this side of the head, it's dark. So we want to make sure we're consistent with our shading. Because if we're trying to sell this effect to the viewer, then we really do need to be consistent. Now the top edge of that ear is gonna grab the light and the bottom edge, I think, it sticks out, but I think it still might be mostly in shadow. And this is kinda, I like this part. I like this part of the of figuring out this sort of thing. It's fun. Cause then I, kinda, I just keep looking at the model and I ask myself, can I really see where the light is coming from? If I just look at the paint job, can I really see where the light is? And then I'll just go and I'll just put little subtle corrections here and there, just play with it. It's just playing. Like, the, don't stress about this sort of thing. You're learning. You're playing with stuff. Playing with stuff is the best way to learn. That's why baby animals play before they learn to hunt. Baby predators, anyway. You know, so play is a good teaching tool. And the best thing about just letting yourself play is that there's nothing in it for your ego to latch onto. You can't get down on yourself for failing because you were just seeing how it worked. You're seeing like, oh, what'll it do if I do this? Does this look great? Ah, this is pretty good, you know? Just play, just play with the colors and see the effects you get. I mean, the great thing about acrylics, and I say this all the time and it's really true, is you can always prime it over or paint over it. There's, there's, especially when you're using paint as thin as me. If I went and I reprimed this entire ogre, I would not lose detail. I would be fine. I've only put like three layers of paint on it and thinned paint at that. So it's not going to build up so much. Um, with this guy, he doesn't even have a back of the head. Like it's really like just the collar. Um, so again, we've got these muscle groups down here. And there I'll have to set him up around my light and then actually look. I want to lurk and see. And there's no really, all up here, that's direct, the light is hitting it directly. So the darkest shadow up here on top of the model is going to be this midtone. There will be no additional brown shadow on top of the model. Unless it's right around the collar here. Because the collar is going to cast a micro shadow. It's shadow. Yeah, no neck. Normally, though, the skull does curve around and cut under, and so you would shade under that cut. Like, when it starts to curve around and curve back under, when it cuts around. But yeah, you do need shading at the back of the head, unless you've got a, a light coming from behind the model. I'm just going to put a real, a real narrow shadow um, around this collar. I haven't decided on the collar yet. Maybe it should be pink. Maybe he likes pink. Maybe he's uh, totally comfortable in his own masculinity and has no problem wearing pink. I don't know. I haven't decided. It's, a, it's kind of a dog collar, so I, I'm tempted to make it funny. 
but I don't know. I like him a lot, so I have to I have to question also pink is not gonna work well with ochre. So that that uh, changes things. Now there will be a darker shadow than this actually in the shadows. Um, there is a harder shadow that comes down in here when it's really under something and things are really cut under. So chances are I will need to mix a darker shadow than this brown and use it very selectively. And this is where, this is what liner simulates, right? When we're using brown liner and I might even use brown liner. It certainly works here. Um, when you're using a liner, what you're trying to, to find is that micro shadow, like the macro shadow that sits right here between my fingers. That's lining. The only reason that, that you're using lining to bring that out is that these guys are so small in scale that trying to do a little blended shade like this, it would just, there's just no room. You can't do it. Um, so you simplify and you use lining. Yeah, so up here I'm gonna I'm gonna get the volume and detail with um, with highlights rather than shadows on the upper upper surfaces of things. That's what you're gonna see. Like if I look at my skin when it's facing the light, mostly what I'm seeing is more highlights. I'll get some micro shadows between like the the wrinkles on my fingers, you know, and stuff like that. But that would never show up at this scale. So instead, I have to hold my hand away from me in the light and see what I see. And usually then it's the variance in highlights. Like my entire skin will look lighter because it's all in the light. And then there will be just some lighter, lighter areas. And the shadow is actually more the base color of my skin. So it's actually the Pentads thing that I'm teaching on my Patreon right now, where you start with five colors and then you shift where the highlights, you use the top three colors, the midtones, you use the middle three colors, and the shadows, you use the bottom three colors. So you have a highlight, a shadow, and a midtone at every section, but for the highlight areas, you're only really using the midtone, first highlight, and second highlight. And likewise, there are no highlight colors used in the shadows. The top two colors aren't even used. So that's, that's why I'm teaching kind of the pentad approach, because that is the way to think about that when you've got a strong light and we know all of this area is going to be in the light except for this shadow underneath the club um, so you're not really except for this side muscle here you're going to get a little shadow here but you're not going to get anything up here with these muscles to bring them out except for highlights so yeah and i think that's pretty much it it is five after we are ready to wrap it up. I'm just gonna block in a little bit more shadow here. I think I really like how this guy is turning out. You can really see see the shadows fall. And I'm very happy with that. I, I still need more shadow here because his head, his the way his head protrudes out, we definitely would have some shadow here and here, right down here in the collarbone area especially. So I definitely need to add more shadows there. I really like how the stomach is, is working right now. Um, he's got a little bit of lines and creases. He's got stretch marks. That's so funny. Intentional or unintentional. That's super funny. Um, but I really like how all this is coming out and how all the details are coming out. I like how his skin is turning more bronzy gold. Um, yeah, so it's really, really good. Yeah, it was nice to see you online, Jazian. Even, even though I know you're skipping sleep to do it. Um, but yeah. So I'm, I'm very happy so far, very happy so far. So we'll continue working around. We haven't gotten to the back yet. I'm gonna have to kind of reverse my lighting there. That's the thing you gotta remember is like, when you're painting with your light source up here, you're like, oh, okay, here. And then you turn it around and you start doing this. But actually the light source is coming from this direction if you're emul emulating the front. So we'll have to actually turn him like this and paint what we see. So remember to always be consistent with your light from front to back. It can be, be very, uh, if you're just working with a light source that's more or less overhead. Uh, it can be very easy to, to reverse them and then it may look right until you really look at it with really in relation to each other and then you're like, oh no. <laughs> Great, awesome, fair skin. It's the tail end rings, yeah it is, hello. So yeah, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Today we talked about warm shadows. We talked about dramatic shadows a lot. Uh, we talked about base coating, getting a smooth base coat, and kind of the 
the techniques in brush loading that you use to get a good smooth base coat, uh, especially on a bigger model like this, but really applicable for any model. Um, we did a little bit of talking about like just at the end about we mentioned lining and what it's trying to simulate. We haven't added any yet on this guy though. We're just trying to get that the shadows that we're trying to get the dramatic shadow effect. We're trying to get it to work. So I think it's working pretty well so far. I'm very happy with him so far. We're going to double down next time and add even some darker shadows to get a more dramatic effect. Um, I try to do that. I like that. Uh, it's kind of my style of painting these days is if I'm starting at a mid-tone, I like to shade and then shade further. So I like to get all my shadows in and then pop in my highlights and really start to see uh, how it looks. So yes, we have Beyond the Kit with Rhonda later today. So please show up and support Rhonda. She is awesome and also a great knowledge presenter in a very different style from myself. So thank you all for coming on. Tomorrow, tomorrow is... Oh yeah, tomorrow's a new model. Woo, lots of new models. We're gonna start on our Hellborn Warlock. So probably do dark reddish demonish skin on him. It'll be fun. So I will see you guys tomorrow. I hope you have a great day and take care.